Okay, so it looks like we need to actually talk about <sighs> Edify again. We are going to be going down that rabbit hole, so we are going to be figuring out more of what they do on their channel, though my uh, original hypothesis that this was just going to be Discount Prager U seems to so far be being affirmed. Uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and take a look at the fan art section. And here we have a piece from Fox of Fate that doesn't make me want to bludgeon my face against a wall. Uh, and it is... You can't cancel me, Cole! I'm Suction Cup Cirrus! Look at me go! I am terrible at that fucking voice, but, uh... There we go. <laughs> there we are. Apparently. Also, Ellie, you're fine. You're okay. With that said... Let's go ahead and roll the intro. And now that the intro's over and my depression is kicked in, because you guys will not let me escape that meme. Come on, Edify. Give me just as many reasons to aliven to that Prager Hugh gives. Let's go. For three years, the world's largest e-retailer, Amazon, sold a book I wrote on their website. Yep. Amazon made money, the publisher made money, I made a little bit of money too, and anybody who wanted to read my book could buy it on Amazon and have it delivered in a few days or less. Okay. Everyone benefited. Until one day, out of nowhere, Amazon erased my book from their website. Okay, so here's the first problem. Who here is familiar with the book When Harry Became Sally? Who here is familiar with this uh, piece of literature? And as you guys do that, I'm going to do something that people on YouTube don't generally get to see. Uh, we're going to... Oh, I can't... Never mind. I'm sitting here trying to get my avatar selection to work, and it's just not doing it. We need to go back... We need to go back to the spoopy model. Because we're getting spooked right now. By all of this nonsense. Okay, uh, you said you can, you've can you heard of it, but you can already guess the arguments in it. It sounds transphobic. So, let's not judge a book by its cover, but... I am somewhat familiar with this book. Uh, Ink Phone, thank you very much for the follow. Uh, there's a particular section of the book that I think kind of shows a lot of what the book says. And while the book does try to basically tread water with uh, what it says, the quote that I want to throw at you is, is really fucking important. Where it, meant, it notes that gender dysphoria is a real thing, which is something that you can get most TERFs to do just fine. But then afterwards, it points out that uh, assisting children in any way, shape, or form uh, with trans issues is unethical. The way that they actually word it, hold on, I can actually grab the quote for you real quick uh, so that we can look at that one here. Okay. Because I believe it was in the Wikipedia article as well. Yeah. So, his hypothesis that was published in USA Today uh, had an explanation... He said that it is profoundly unethical to intervene in the normal physical development of a child as part of affirming their gender identity that is at odds with their physical sex. Uh, and there are quotation marks around affirming and gender identity. So despite the fact that the experts largely are okay with uh, gender affirming treatment when it comes to people who are suffering from gender dysphoria... Apparently, that gender-affirming treatment is something that he does not believe should be offered. Now, before we continue the video, I should probably clarify as to why gender-affirming treatment when it comes to children is important. When we have gender-affirming treatment for children, we usually are only using uh, puberty blockers. Uh, we can use those for about five or six years or so. Um, and puberty blockers don't have that many side effects, all, all things considered. Not that you aren't going to be experiencing on HIT anyway. So, with puberty blockers, what we are doing is we are trying to prevent the glands in your body that produce either testosterone or estrogen uh, from basically getting absorbed. Like, it's, it's just stopping all of that from happening, because that's the stuff that causes you to go through your puberty. If you are born male, and you do not feel comfortable in that body, and you may want to transition, then it <sighs> there are certain things that are very, very hard to do. And uh, things like reversing the way that your voice sounds. There's only so far that vocal training can go, and even procedures like shaving uh, your voice box does uh, ha has a lot of high risks and doesn't always work perfectly, uh, and sometimes doesn't work at all. So even if you 
you know, go through puberty as normal and, and suffer through all of that, which, again, that position necess uh, necessitates that children must suffer uh, if they do suffer from gender dysphoria. It necessitates that they must suffer for a certain amount of time arbitrarily. Um, but on top of the, the suffering issue is the issue that once they become an adult and then can go get uh, gender-affirming treatment, that treatment has another hurdle now, two hurdles. One hurdle is their ability to actually be still insured under their parents. It's a whole lot harder to do that once you become an adult, especially after the age of 25. Um, the second major issue is, again, there are parts of especially male puberty that are very hard to reverse, and there are parts of female puberty that cause you to actually go in for surgeries that you might not want to do. Nike Bree says, is that why trans women seem to have a certain unique quality to their voice? Sometimes it depends on the person. There are trans women who were able to have puberty blockers growing up, and they are completely indistinguishable. Uh, there are also ones that were testosterone-resistant growing up, and therefore uh, didn't have the same larynx issues. There's a, a ton of stuff that goes on where that's concerned, but it is generally harder for AMAB uh, trans women to have a voice that does not cause them more suffering later in life through dysphoria without the help of things like puberty blockers. And again, puberty blockers are generally what we use when we are talking about affirming a, a child's gender identity early on. We're not putting them through surgeries. We're not putting them through... We're not injecting the, uh, the, the testosterones into them. We are generally just blocking a puberty that they do not consent to from happening. Okay, continue on. Customers could no longer order or even see the book on Amazon. Amazon didn't warn me or my publisher, they just took it down. I'll give you a hint as to why. I'm an outspoken opponent of the Equality Act, and the title of my book is When Harry Became Sally. That, uh, that's not the reason why you actually pulled it off. Like the Amazon actually specifically like talked about why. Your video was not up, and I, I need to actually show the video itself. I wasn't showing the video. I'm a bad YouTuber. I'm sorry. But if you look over here on the Wall Street Journal, uh, they actually did say a couple things. One, Amazon says they reserve the right to not sell certain content. Uh, it's not censorship if, if, a, if a place says they don't want to sell your book. I'm sorry. Uh, but... The other thing that they said here is that anything that potentially shows uh, LGBTQ issues as a, as a framing point for mental illness is something that they will not be showing on their website uh, as they figure out that it's there. And because of the way in which you approach issues, especially regarding our most vulnerable populations, that's why your book was taken down. Like, and Amazon made no bones about that. They've been honest about that. Has nothing to do with you being an opponent of the Equality Act. Has nothing to do with the title of your book. Has everything to do with the content of your book. And this, this is a non, this is a non-starter. This is a non-thing. When people frame the reason why they were censored as because of their political opinions you'd have to then contextualize every other person who is also an opponent of the Equality Act who still has their books online and go, well, Occam's Razor says that it can't be that. But it does make for a very narratively convincing talking point when you can say, I was censored because my opinions. Responding to the transgender moment. What is my book about? It's a thorough examination of the scientific, medical, philosophical, and legal debates surrounding the trans phenomenon. I took painstaking effort to research everything I wrote so the book would be accurate and fair. So, even if you researched everything, that does not mean that you presented everything accurately and fairly. I talked about the issues in a way that was compassionate towards people with gender dysphoria, which is a medical diagnosis in the official Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Okay. The book was endorsed by numerous medical and legal... Note that he said he specifically has sympathy for people who suffer from gender dysphoria, but not trans people. There's a there's a very specific language being used there. Support of people with dysphoria does not necessarily equate to support of people who are trans. Experts from Ivy League universities. And it wasn't merely an academic book. I strive to make the book as accessible as possible so that ordinary people could pick up the book and understand it. Predictably, my book took a lot of heat when it was released, mm -hmm. and a lot of lies were told about it. Like but what? for three years, Amazon sold it like any Wait, are you going to say what those lies are? Their book they offer without issue. Then, suddenly, 
One afternoon, just days before Congress was set to vote on the Equality Act, my book vanished from Amazon's web. Well, that had nothing to do with the Equality Act. And also, you do know that, like, a book being able to be sold for a certain amount of time and then a, pub uh, a, a publisher or a seller pulling it because of a million things that can happen internally in that company have happened. Like for instance, the person who made that decision could, uh, who is responsible for that decision could have changed within the company around that time. Uh, a policy on Amazon could change within that time, changing what they can sell in their store. There's a million ways in which this can happen that are not attributed to your position on the equality act. Website. My publisher and I reached out to Amazon and they told us the book violated their content policies. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't tell us what the violation was or why after selling on their website for three years, it only now suddenly violated their content policies. Well, a couple of reasons. One, content policies can change. And uh, two, your book going on their website does not necessarily mean that people know what content policies it might have actually like fucked, uh, fucked with. Like, I've had content that's been on my channel for ages, and then because YouTube changed their guidelines on something, certain pieces of content that were on my channel before ended up having to get removed. Think the video that I did on Steven Anderson during the height of the, uh, the pumpkin saga, uh, where he just said he was gay repeatedly. That video got removed on YouTube, and I've had to put that onto other platforms uh, so that people can see that, because it's just a YouTube poop. But... They still said that it violated their, cur uh, their current updated policies, and that's just what happens. I understand that there's a narrative here where, like, you're the smaller guy and you want to be uh, the victim, and I, I, I get that. But, again, they have the right to pull your shit. Amazon is not a communally owned thing where you get a vote in that. Should it? That's a conversation for a different day. It took a letter from four U.S. senators demanding an explanation to get Amazon to finally explain why. And Amazon said they removed my book because, quote, we have chosen not to sell books that frame LGBTQ plus identity as a mental illness. Yep, that's now, what we found book, too. Now in my book, I never referred to LGBTQ identity as a mental illness. Amazon is lying. My book did, however, acknowledge something everyone agrees on. Gender dysphoria is a serious condition that can cause great suffering to people who have it. Okay. There is disagreement among medical professionals and the general public about how to respond and help people with gender dysphoria. And there is where the disagreement is. You see, here's the thing about policies. You can have a broad policy that has different ways in which it can be interpreted. When you have a, a broad policy that says we do not like discrimination, um, but there are nuances in the ways in which that manifests, those are part of the conversation. Let's continue. What are the long-term health consequences of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormone injections on gender dysphoric patients? Um, so the, okay, so the long-term consequences of puberty blockers, for the most part, uh, calcium deficiency. That's like the main thing that we have found is that cal it's a, uh, there, there, there is chances for calcium deficiency and there's also a chance for infertility. But remember, these are both chances and these chances align also with the chances of infertility and calcium issues that come with late stage puberty. When you have a very, very late stage puberty, the amount of time that your body was growing and developing uh, without the hormones that are normally in your body at that time, that's what it, that, that, that it's, it's, it's basically the same thing as far as we've been able to tell. Now, longer term, there are people who are adults now who have had puberty blockers and we know the long-term consequences with that is as well, yeah, for the most part. Just like with all medications, more studies are being done, but puberty blockers are a thing that have been used for more than just trans people. Puberty blockers have been used for people who are at a high risk of breast cancer and do not need to have development of breasts because they literally caught it at a very, very young age. And to stop that cancer from being able to metabolize the, the proteins that it needs to continue to grow and cause damage and potentially kill the person, they just use puberty blockers so that the breast tissue cannot grow and develop it and therefore the cancer starves. We've been using them in treatments like this outside. And in those treatments, people don't bitch about using puberty blockers. But when it's trans people, magically they do. Uh, as far as 
quote, cross-sex hormones. Uh, we know the consequences of those as well. They are the same consequences of just having fucking hormones in you. Gee, I wonder what the consequences of testosterone in a body are. Gee, holy fuck shit, I do not know. It is almost like we have years of research on what testosterone is. It is almost as if we have years of research on what estrogen is. Health consequences of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormone injections on gender dysphoric patients. Should children be allowed to begin the so-called transition process without their parents' consent? Uh, so it's not the parents, it's, okay. So here's the thing. The transition process. If you're a child and you're hitting ages 11 or 12, which is when you would be starting puberty, uh, puberty blockers is the transition process at that point. And being able to receive a psychological evaluation is part of that process as well, where you can go through exercises and stuff to, ter to determine whether or not you are actually suffering from dysphoria or potentially uh, are just experiencing so much euphoria in a in a different gender, though aside from the one you were assigned at birth, that it is better for your mental health to function as that gender. Now, when you are going through that process, should a parent's consent be considered? Yes. Should a parent's consent be required? No. Because here's the thing. The idea that parents always know best when it comes to their children is fucking wrong. There are Jehovah's Witness parents that will not allow their children to receive blood transfusions because of their religious beliefs. That is a directly damaging thing, and in that instance, we literally would have to go, okay, either the child fucking dies, by the way, when you uh, refuse trans-affirming care, uh, or gender-affirming care to trans people, the likelihood of their suicidality increases infinitely, so, again, if we have a situation where somebody might fucking die, we would then go, okay, the parent's consent is noted and considered, but it is not necessary, and I don't see anything wrong with that. At the end of the day, the parent cannot step into their child's shoes, they cannot step into their child's brain and make any determination based on that. They can have a say, they can have a conversation, but... At the end of the day, it's not their body. Their child is an autonomous being. And again, puberty blockers, the whole point of puberty blockers is to buy time for the children. But, you know, continue. Should men and boys be allowed in girls' bathrooms and women's sports? I'm so tired of reading this. I'm so tired of hearing this. Okay, so here's the thing. Because you said, should men and boys be allowed in girls' bathrooms, you've given it away. You've given the entirety of the conversation away where this is concerned. Because trans women are not men and boys. Trans women are trans women and trans girls. Or undecided in the case of somebody who is underage. Should they be allowed in girls' bathrooms? Yes, they don't cause statistically more harm than, than good in there in those situations and should they be allowed in women's sports i don't know let's defer to some experts let's defer to the olympics the olympics say that uh if you've been on hrt for a year then you should be allowed to participate in the sport of the gender that uh, you conform to not the gender you were born into I don't know. I think they would know a little bit more about sports than you, but that's just me. Uh, past that, I'll give my usual response that I give on sports. As much as that upsets certain people, I know, especially in the atheist community, of which I am still very much a part of, uh, I don't give a fuck about sports. I don't. I care more about people's well-being and identity than I care about uh, sports ball. I, 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 just, I just don't fucking care. These are all important questions which Americans should be able to discuss. Yeah, they can. Public polling shows that on many of these issues examined in the book, majorities of Americans agree with the positions I take. That doesn't matter. Ad populum is a fallacy for a reason. It literally does not fucking matter that the majority of Americans believe in you. Nobody fucking cares. Of course, many Americans disagree with my positions, and that's okay for now. That's the point of the book, to change people's minds. It's okay for now? No, it's always been okay for people to disagree with you. And again, it doesn't fucking matter what the majority of Americans think. I'm sorry. First of all, as an American, can I say we're fucking stupid? We are dumb. 
Secondly, more importantly, what the majority of Americans think and what expert consensus is are two different conversations, and I would rather care about expert consensus than any of this shit. Also, uh, Z Dao Dun brings up a good point in the chat. If they did the whole puberty blockers thing from the start uh, and then transitioned into their preferred gender, there wouldn't be an advantage slash disadvantage conversation at all because the advantage is given by whichever hormone is predominant in their body would be gone. Like, those advantages wouldn't fucking exist because the hormone's not being metabolized by the body at that point. Uh, also, just pointing out there, does... Does anybody here recognize or, or remember or, or realize that when it comes to trans issues in sports, when you discriminate against trans women, you also inadvertently end up discriminating against women who have naturally higher testosterone counts due to things like uh, PCOS and shit? Like, th this, is, this is shit that has happened. There have been people who have been fucked with specifically because they have higher testosterone counts than normal, even though they are cis women. But, you know, it's just that that part of the conversation just gets ignored, I guess. And that's why Amazon is really afraid of my ideas. They're not afraid they're... of your they're not afraid of your ideas, though. Nobody's fucking afraid of your ideas. Oh, my God. This 2002 edgy Shadow the Hedgehog LARPing Amazon.com is just afraid of my ideas. You're a beta male, Sonic. Persuading people of the truth. Amazon's actions show that it is not OK with that. Its leaders believe they're- Wait, but no, it's not that they're not okay with the truth. It's that they're not okay with the way you framed shit. And again, it is- Them not selling your shit? They retain a right to not sell your shit. Their corporate position on the transgender issue is the only acceptable one. I refuted that position and spoke out against the Equality Act. You didn't refute that position, and the fact that you spoke out against the Equality Act means I really don't like you as a person. But you didn't refute that position, you disagreed with that position. And there is a difference between those two concepts. Act, And that's why they removed my book. Now, that's you not. might be thinking Amazon is a private company. You can't force them to sell something they don't want to. Correct. And ordinarily, I would agree with you. No, it, it, no, you're going to you're going to special plead here. You're going to special plead. You're going to special plead, and you're going to do so by saying that they own 80% of the share in the publishing industry, correct? But the problem is that Amazon absolutely dominates book sales. Yep. And all online sales, as it's the largest global online retail platform. Yeah. According to independent... But you violated their policies, and that was on you. I'm sorry, your book can still be sold elsewhere. Fucking deal with it. And in analysts... Amazon accounts for 53% of all books sold. I thought in the it was United 80%. States, and 80% oh, of no. all ebooks. 80% of all ebooks, that's what it was. I thought it was 80% of all books. Well, shit, if it's just 53 if it, it okay, 53% is a massive amount of US book sales, but if you get your shit being sold by other publishers, you can account for most of that. At, at the end of the day, you're more upset that you're not making money from your book than you are anything else. Amazon is abusing their vast market share in the book industry when it prevents Americans from reading ideas Amazon leaders don't like. Nobody's preventing people from reading that. I could pirate your book right now. I could pirate your book literally today, and I could read the entirety of your gobshit. It, it, preventing Americans from reading ideas? No, people can still find your book. Is your book available at Barnes? You know what? Let's Let's take a look here. Let's take a look here. Your book is called When Harry Became Sally, right? I can find your book at Thrift Books. I can find it on eBay. I can find it at Walmart? Fucking Walmart? I can find it at fucking Barnes & Noble? What? Dude, you're not even- you're not being oppressed or some shit. I can find your book anywhere! Every fucking common shit, every common ass place to find books at, I can find it. Oh my god, this is, this is, this is just bad. Now here one might say that if you don't like Amazon's practices, you can start your own global online sales company. That, that is not an argument. I'm sorry, that's a dumb argument. He's good, he's responding to a straw man here. My argument specifically is not that you could just start your own global book company. My argument is that you have shit tons of places your book can be sold at and that you don't need specifically Amazon. But because Amazon controls most of the book market, publishers have no choice but to cater to Amazon's ideology. 
ideology. God fucking damn it, this word again. Irregardless of how you think it's supposed to be pronounced. If the largest bookseller in the world won't sell a book, why would a publisher print it? Um, because Walmart will? Not to mention, didn't you have conversations with your publisher? And your publisher was still okay printing your book? Your publisher still prints your book right now! How is this a problem for you? What? Just like that, Amazon can control not just which books get sold, but which books get published in the first place. No, your publisher is... Okay, look, if your publisher can only throw your shit on, uh, on Walmart or Target, that's not a huge issue, okay? I'm sorry, I know that you think that this is big, and again, Amazon controls a lot of the industry, and that's a problem because Monopoly is a problem, but your argument isn't about Monopoly. Your argument is that you want your book sold by Amazon specifically. Amazon's still a private company, and I know that you think you refuted that argument, but at the end of the day, the way they're currently structured, if you want them to be able to still maintain their abilities as a private company, then you have to accept the consequences of that. The consequences of that is that they get to choose whether your shit gets published on their platform. I'm sorry. <laughs> Amazon is using their outsized market share to shut down debate. You can buy- The debate hasn't been shut down. You're literally on a YouTube video talking about it. No debate has been shut down. Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf on Amazon, but you can't buy an honest examination of the trans issue on Amazon. Okay, so Mein Kampf is a piece of history. It is a piece that is to be analyzed and looked at for- how it contextualizes a historical figure that we know to be despicable. Your book is propaganda. And does this count as Godwin's Law? Yeah, uh, yeah, this is probably just fucking Godwin's Law at this point. And that should concern everyone. I'm Ryan Anderson, author and president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center for Edify. This is Scott Landry, director of Edify. Wait, he's, oh my God, it's just PragerU. It's just PragerU. Every speaker they get on is like, I am I am from PragerU. Every fucking one. Oh my god. So, I could be wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but one sec. I could have sworn that Katie Montgomery, at the very least, did a thing on When Harry Became Sally because I wanted to suggest somebody look at that. But I, I will need to find uh, a creator who is going over that book as well at this point uh, because I'm not I, – I, it's just not the kind of content that I do. I'm trying to find one that I can link in the description. Uh, but that said, just fucking – you know that episode of Powerpuff Girls where Mojo Jojo is saying, I'm being oppressed, and a bunch of hippies come and save him from the Powerpuff Girls every single time he's doing a crime? That's this. That's this video. The entirety of this video. And just... Uh, it's just PragerU. It's just PragerU. That's all it is. It's just PragerU again. <sighs> I don't know. What do you guys think in the comment section below? Let me know what you what you think. Have you read this book? Do you know about this book? What are your opinions? What are your thoughts? I just... Watching conservatives bitch about being victims is, is agitating sometimes. With that said, though, if you enjoyed this content and what I do, hit the like button, hit the subscribe if you haven't already, hit the follow button over on Twitch if you haven't already, and as always, everyone, instant end video tagline here. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. It really means a lot to me. If you want access to behind the scenes content for the channel, please consider checking out my Patreon. I do weekly vlogs over there where I give uh, real life updates to what's going on behind the scenes on the channel, stuff that you don't really get uh, over here and, and even on Twitch. Uh, Patreon also helps the channel's stability a whole lot. Without Patreon, I wouldn't be able to do this at all. Especially with the kind of content that I do, neither YouTube nor Twitch are the most stable sources of income. If you are a $20 and up patron, then you will be featured on the ending slides as shown in the beginning of the end credits. If you want to catch the streams where all this content comes from, then consider heading over to Twitch and following. And if you want to continue watching over here on YouTube, maybe consider clicking one of the end screen videos. And once again, I want to thank you so much for spending your time with me over on my channel. I wouldn't be able to do literally anything that I'm doing over here on YouTube without each and every one of you. So thank you.